So uh, at the end of game turn zero, which is actually the first turn of the game, um, I just wanted to mention a couple things. So at this scale, the movement and the terrain penalties for movement are extremely slow. Um, it feels like units can't really move a, a lot uh, when they're um, when they're on the on the march. Um, you can tell because uh, a lot of these units here basically just started on this side of the Drina River, and they have had um, two move phases, a counter move um, and a regular move phase, and they've gotten this far. And the same is true over here with the um, Serbians. They have a bit better terrain to move through, so they've been able to move a little further. I have been using Forced March uh, to get some of these units uh, going west and as well to get across the river quickly. And uh, you can see that some of the brigades and divisions have actually taken combat effectiveness hits because of the, using that force march. In particular, this cavalry had some trouble getting across that river right there. I'm trying to get that cavalry division into a position where it can counterattack if some of these Austro-Hungarian river crossings end up going well. Um, speaking of river crossings, uh, you can see everyone with one of these, oops, everyone with one of these uh, river crossing markers on them uh, crossed the Sava River. Um, so you can ignore what's on the river crossing markers. There's actually new ones. Uh, so what these should say is half uh, artillery value, half strength. Um, and they take two turns to go away. Um, you can see that the Austro-Hungarians have built some bridges here. Um, so now the rest of these forces can follow on to get across, and that's going to be bad news for the Serbians, although the Serbians go first on this upcoming turn one, and a bunch of their inactive units down here uh, will become active. Um, so that's kind of the lay of the land. Uh, again, Austro-Hungarians having a lot of trouble marching through this uh, really tough terrain. I think this may be the only game where it costs three movement points to uh, use road, which is seems pretty hefty, but I guess, you know, at this scale, we're talking about long distances. You'll notice there's no movement factors on the counters, and that's because every unit gets to move nine movement points in its... Uh, movement regular movement phase and five movement points in its counter movement phase and so just that's true of basically every unit in the game um, and what you're really looking at is if you want to go further do you use force march and potentially take hits to your combat effectiveness which can affect um, losses and how well you do in combat so it's a really interesting system kind of a risk reward movement system and really uh, benefits those you know benefits people who you know want to gamble at important moments to try and get further um, this unit in particular here this Loznica brigade uh, was in Loznica it got surrounded by these Austro-Hungarians and so it had to do a move to the rear which was it's essentially a free move out of zones of control before it got attacked um, but when it does that, it gets reduced and takes a combat effectiveness hit. So uh, that is not a unit in fighting shape as it sort of evacuated out of the town of Loznica, or Loznica, I guess, maybe. Um, so anyways, just wanted to show you that. Um, next time I come back, I, I will show you what a combat looks like. I just have to get to one. Um, so far, it's been a lot of maneuver and a lot of slow maneuver at that. And so, uh, but now that the Austro-Hungarians have the bridgeheads here, uh, it looks like they're going to, you know, stream across in numbers and try and take it to the Serbians. All right, I wanted to show an attack example here. Um, we're in the Austro-Hungarian turn. The Austro-Hungarian 18th Division and 8th Brigade have moved up along this road. They want to attack this Montenegrin uh, regiment who is stationed here in this, uh, this village in this high plateau. So first things first, we need to see if there are uh, any considerations for, um, well, look, for column shifts and what have you, but... Um, I think it'd be easier to explain if I show you who can attack and who cannot. So we have one and a half division equivalents here um, trying to attack. Now, you cannot attack with that many in plateau terrain because it is considered a mountainous terrain. You can only have the maximum as a division and a quarter be able to attack into this terrain. So that means that the 18th division is the only one who can attack in this particular example. So they're going to do so. So right now it is a nine to two, but because we are in plateau, the defender is getting uh, plus two defensive strength. So it is actually nine to four. Um, so yeah, so nine to four, that is going to be rolled on the two to one column, I believe. Yeah, two to one column. 
Now we need to look at artillery. So artillery is actually built in on the counter. You can see here this one has an artillery value of 2. The uh, Montenegrin unit has no artillery value. But in order to use that artillery value, we first have to see if we are in supply um, and if we can get a supply line to get those artillery shells to the front. Well, we are in supply to our core train, and our core train is in supply just barely, it's on the edge, uh, to the 6th Army Depot back there. So we can use our full artillery value. Now, normally there's a column shift if you have artillery superiority over your opponent, meaning you have two to one, but you need at least three artillery value in order to be able to do that. In this case, he doesn't have it. Um, so any other column shifts that we're looking at, if there was a prepared attack, um, if the, the enemy is being flanked, if there was um, an elevation change uphill, that'd be a negative column shift for the attacker. And if you were attacking into an improved position, none of those things are true. I believe we are at the same elevation, yet yeah, both on top of this plateau. Um, we do have to designate a lead unit, so each side's unit is going to be the lead unit, three and two. Now that difference does give a column shift uh, to the person who is higher, so we do get a rightward column shift for the attacker. So we are rolling on the five to two column, which is the weirdest column I've seen in a war game in a long time. Uh, so the five to two column, and, um, and then now before I roll the dice, we have to declare whether or not the attack is going to be intense or not intense for each side. Now this has some sort of um, implications to the combat. I won't go into it uh, too much, but basically the attacker decides, are they gonna make an intense attack? The defender decides, are they gonna make an intense defense? And based on a combination of who chooses what, um, there's certain, um, it's more likely that you will uh, take combat effectiveness um, penalties and or losses if you choose to do uh, intensity and then don't get a retreat result. So in this case, if the attacker is intense and they don't get a retreat result on their roll, then uh, they will take a plus one modifier to checking their losses and um, effectiveness. And the opposite is true of the defender. If the defender is chooses intense but gets a retreat result, then it is... Um, uh, bad for them, essentially. So uh, in this particular combat, the Austro-Hungarians, uh, they are, um, well, they are, hmm. so there's a number of mandated attacks that the Austro-Hungarian uh, armies have to make before they can abandon their strategic objective. Uh, and uh, they will go ahead in this particular instance and declare that it is an intense attack. The Montenegrins, not so uh, eager to have uh, an intense defense, they can fall back. So it will be an attacker at intense combat, um, and that means if the attacker fails to achieve a retreat result on this roll, they will get a plus one modifier to their uh, loss and effectiveness check. So let's find out. We roll the dice. They rolled a six. That's pretty good on five to two. That is a plus one for the attacker and a plus three for the defender with a retreat result of one hex if the combat is attacker intense. It is an, it is an attacker intense combat, so they have to fall back. Um, they will go here. Now, unfortunately, that type of retreat result, result that they achieved um, was not the kind that would have negated the penalty for being intense. So they have a plus one uh, modifier to their result, which actually makes it a plus two for the attacker and a plus three for the defender. Then we check the combat magnitude and see what that means for them. So it is a small combat given the size of the units that were involved. And um, a small combat at plus two for the attacker, no strength reductions are taken. And plus three for the defender at small is no strength reductions are taken. So no one suffers a step loss um, or elimination or um, uh, strength reduction, which is good for everyone involved. Um, and now we have to do an effectiveness check. So after the combat, we're going to look and see uh, and make a check for each unit involved in the combat uh, for this number here in the circle. We're going to roll 2d6 apply the modifiers from the, um, the CRT and, uh, and see if we take a combat effectiveness penalty. So we'll do the, the, uh, the Austro-Hungarians first. You can't see it, but their uh, force marker on the 6th Army display is 10, and they have a plus 2 modifier to this. So we roll 2d6, they roll a 5, so they pass. You have to roll equal to or less than your uh, combat effectiveness. The Montenegrins are a 10, they have a plus 3, and they rolled an 8. So uh, they, uh, unfortunately, they missed it by one. So they rolled an eight, plus three is 11. And when you miss your combat effectiveness, you take a, by one, you take a, um, a combat effectiveness penalty. Now, unfortunately for the Montenegrins, 
the, the he is a, is a regiment size unit. So he is an what's called an asset unit versus what's called a formation unit. When an asset unit has to fails their uh, combat effectiveness, they actually have to take instead of a combat effectiveness reduction because this number can never go lower. They actually have to take a strength reduction, which means a step loss. And when we flip this unit over, we see that this is a one step um, Montenegrin unit, which means that this unit is eliminated. And so the Austro-Hungarians have uh, defeated the Montenegrins in this high altitude combat, and uh, they get to advance uh, into this hex. Actually, I need to check to see if, if this unit was not part of the attack, do they get to advance as well? I'll check that in the rules, and then um, I will update you in the next video. But that's how combat works, and um, I really enjoy the fact that it models sort of um, the attritional nature of World War I. Um, you're not going to be doing lots of step reductions all the time, especially not to bigger division size units. In fact, I don't think you can actually eliminate division units unless you completely surround them and they're isolated when they um, take a strength, re strength reduction. But uh, so some of these smaller units, the, um, the uh, regiments and the brigades, they uh, can potentially be eliminated. But for the most part, you're gonna be pushing units back, making them combat ineffective. They're gonna have to go try and move away from the front to recover before they can come back. And so you're, you've got like this nice, um, this combat system that's a little inscrutable, um, but uh, sort of models the effect of the, the wearing down of units over time. Uh, so that's a look at some of the combats. Um, I'll show you maybe one or two more before the video uh, playthrough is over. Uh, if there's something really pivotal and interesting happening, but otherwise you get the idea. It's a three-step process. Um, once you do it a couple times, it kind of goes a little faster, uh, but very interesting and very unlike other war games that I have ever played. I'm noticing, I mean, I'm only uh, at the end of turn two here, but already there's been just some incredible action. There's been just furious fighting along this river line as the Serbians try and push back the Austro-Hungarians. Uh, so, um, Austro-Hungarians built a pontoon bridge here, and that allowed this um, 29th Infantry Division to cross the river and then make an attack and push out the Sabak um, regiment that was stationed in Sabak, which is a Victory Point city. Every turn that you control the city, on your turn, the end, you get a Victory Point for it. So Serbia scored uh, the first turn, and then uh, the Austro-Hungarians just took it and scored this turn, so we're back to an even game. The um, the Drina Brigade um, had a couple of regiments with it. They crossed the river here via a pontoon bridge that they built. Um, and the Serbians, just huge counterattack with these two infantry divisions, came in. Um, the first assault actually was not a uh, success. It, it did make the Danny, uh, Donny uh, Brigade a little bit less combat effective. Uh, but then the Austro-Hungarians were able to bring another regiment across. And in the counterattack phase of the Austro-Hungarian turn, the Serbians attacked again and um, just got a great result. Huge damage. They knocked the uh, the stack basically back several hexes. Um, they destroyed the pontoon bridge here and have sort of secured this flank. The Austro-Hungarians thought maybe they could get like a quick dart across these uh, this infantry division and this infantry division are still yet to activate in the game and that's where most of the strength of the second army lies so uh it's just been back and forth really furious fighting um this stack now actually is combat ineffective they've taken so many uh combat effectiveness losses and they lost one of their regiments um that they're gonna have to pull back and uh spend some time reorganizing to get back uh thankfully they are stacked with a marsh replacement regiment which is this m here so that should allow um the uh, brigade to get back to full strength when we get to the first interphase after turn three, assuming the situation is still um, the same. But I am noticing that because both sides get to move an attack on uh, every half turn, um, there's a lot of action that happens in a particular uh, particular turn. The other sort of big, um, let's see if I can move the camera. The other sort of big action has been happening in these foothills here. This Sumadian division was attacked by the 13th Corps. Um, the attack was a disaster, and uh, the 13th Corps uh, ended up taking a strength reduction, or division, excuse me, the uh, 42nd Division ended up taking a strength reduction. They also took a couple of combat ineffective hits, so uh, they are also kind of hurting, and the Serbian player, every turn gets to place these, they have three of them, Komataji markers. They um, make the unit they are stacked with have plus one strength, so the Serbians are going to try and hold this line here, um, and this unit here is actually well positioned in this uh, low mountains hex here, so a lot of defensive bonus here, and so the the um, 
eighth core is going to have to figure out what they're going to do. They may do a prepared attack uh, next turn to get the column shifts, uh, but it's going to be a tough nut to crack. And obviously, as you, what you can't see off of this side of the screen is more Serbian infantry divisions uh, flooding in as well as a cavalry division to try and hold this hold this area. Um, so really great storyline so far, and I'm very early in the game. Uh, you would think the Austro-Hungarians would be able to have the numerical advantage, but a lot of these Serbian units have better proficiency ratings, and that column shift has been coming up huge, not to mention the fact that the Serbians have been rolling really well in their combats, and the Austro-Hungarians have not. So pretty exciting, really enjoying the game uh, as it stands right now. So uh, just a quick update here. The Austro-Hungarians have decided that they are going to make a big offensive push against these units uh, this one on a low mountain uh, position and this one in these foothills. They're trying to find a soft spot to drive in here. I, this is probably their best chance. Some of these uh, units, let's see, in the 13th core here are uh, a little bit uh, damaged. Their combat effectiveness is lower, so that means it's more likely that after this combat they will be degraded even further. But they feel they need to make some progress here and not stall out so early in the campaign. Um, a little bit to the north, the uh, the Serbians were able to push back the Austro-Hungarians in Sabac and take that back and score a victory point for it. And now they just want to sit on that as long as possible because every turn, uh, every one of their turns, they will score if they hold it. Um, they did a strength reduction to the Austro-Hungarian division there, but the uh, Sava fleet is ready with artillery support and backup in case there's another attack. I don't think the Serbians have enough strength to push them back across this pontoon bridge um, at the moment, um, and that's a critical juncture for the Austro Hungarians to hold because right now it's their only foothold over the river that will incur major penalties. Meanwhile, the fourth corps is kind of setting up here for an attack either on this two hex unit or to try and push these guys back. Um, this is going to be a tough one to crack. It's a big, powerful stack with artillery. Here, the uh, this infantry division is threatening to cross the river here if some of this stuff succeeds and do a little, you know, end around. Um, so the Austro-Hungarians got to be careful. Um, they may need to wait for some reinforcements, but uh, it's a nice cat and mouse game happening up here along the river and a uh, brick wall uh, and immovable objects down here in the west. So uh, cool situation, and uh, we'll see how it plays out over the next couple turns. And on their very first prepared attack, the Austro-Hungarians rolled a 12, which is the worst possible thing you can roll, and it basically makes the attack an utter disaster, uh, caused two strength reductions, so they're going to have to figure out a different situation, a different strategy for that unit on that mountain. So uh, a bit of a rules confusion here that I'm not quite sure how to address. I'm probably just going to house rule it, but you can see these... Um, these arrows that cross the Sava River, like here, that's how this guy was able to get across without taking a river marker. Basically, anytime you cross the Sava River, you're supposed to get a river marker that halves your stats, unless you cross at one of these river bend locations, which are beneficial. Now, the supply rules say that you are, the supply cannot cross the Sava River, your supply trace, unless you have a river marker on you, meaning you would have had to cross somewhere, or through a pontoon bridge, for example. Um, uh, that's the only way you can be in supply if you cross the Sava River without a bridge. You put a river marker on you. Now, you don't get a river marker if you go across the river bend like this, um, but the supply rules and the river rules don't mention what happens with your supply. It doesn't make sense to me that it's easier to cross across with the arrow, but then you're out of supply when you get to the other side. My gut, or like the way I read what's supposed to happen here is that I would guess that supply can go the direction of the arrow. I, I would I would guess it, because otherwise it doesn't make sense to have these arrows because uh, there's there's sort of less penalties for crossing here. But if you're immediately going to be out of supply on the other side, um, then uh, it doesn't make sense to use them unless the only thing I can think of is um, um yeah, it doesn't make any sense because the only units south of the river that can get supply are those with river crossing markers or across a bridge. So. It has to be just an oversight in the rules. I would guess that you can get supply if if it's coming across uh, the the arrow the way that it's from the supply source. So, for example, up here, I'm going to play it that way because it doesn't really make much thematic sense otherwise that you would have to put your units into a dangerous position even though there are spots on the board where you're sort of incentivized not to do that. Um, so, yeah. So, if anyone has any, uh, like, thoughts on that or someone who knows the system better. Um, I looked through the rules and could not find a sp specific case where a unit crosses the the uh, river bend arrow the correct direction but then is out it, like has some supply effect to it. So anyways, I'm playing with the I'm playing that this guy is in supply um, because that would only make sense that he could get across easier. 
Okay, so we have reached the first interphase of the game. This is where the Austro-Hungarians will score uh, points for invading uh, inner Serbia, essentially everything east of Hex, uh, Hex Row 20, basically, will score points. So that's significant because this unit lasted two turns across the river here, um, where, it, where it came across, um, and despite Serbian attacks, heavy Serbian attacks, it was able to hold on without uh, having to retreat. And uh, therefore, is going to score the Serbian or the Austro-Hungarians five points. It is column twenty-five, so you subtract twenty from that. Five points. Every interphase that you've invaded, sort of central Serbia, you get points. So that's really big for the Austro-Hungarians. Um, the Serbians tried to punch him out of there on the final turn in a counterattack, but uh, he just they didn't roll well, and obviously you can see he took a loss here. Um, unfortunately, the Austro-Hungarians also tried to press. Um, against the uh, Serbians here. And, um, you know, potentially should have not done that because they would have scored another point for being in this hex row. But they wanted to push the Serbians off of Sabak, which is worth a point. And unfortunately, it didn't go well. They had to retreat back across the pontoon bridge. They got another strength reduction. So uh, this force is now combat ineffective. They're going to have to take some time to uh, recover. And uh, now the Serbians have sort of, they can destroy the pontoon bridge here. Um, the Over here, the uh, 8th Corps is shifting to the north. They're going to try and bypass this unit that's on top of this peak here, which is proving to be a tough one to crack. Um, and elsewhere, um, the 13th Corps has moved in against this cavalry unit, who is also holding some high ground. They got uh, reinforced with a regiment there. Um, but uh, that one should also be probably tough to crack. The 13th Corps has some uh, combat effectiveness problems. This unit here is uh, weakened, as is uh, the unit underneath here, who also has a strength reduction. Yep. So uh, it's slow going, um, as you would expect in World War One. Um, you know, there's even though it looks like there's a lot of units on the board, you're really only doing one or two attacks a turn that seems like they can work out for you. The Austro-Hungarians, especially up on the river, really need to concentrate their artillery forces with these fleets, these river fleets. And, um, and you know, if you have good positioning, it really uh, keeps the, the odds to sort of middle one-to-one -one or somewhere in that area. And frequently, the Serbian units actually have better proficiency ratings, and so they're getting an automatic column shift. So it's pretty tough for the Austro-Hungarians to bring force to bear. Um, in a way that will lead to sort of a breakthrough. It's a pretty grindy. Um, the most interesting stuff has definitely been up by the river. But uh, with those points being scored, the Serbians have three and the Austro-Hungarians score five. So the Austro-Hungarians actually have two points now at the end of this interface. We're going to get replacements um, onto the front for, for each side. They each get five um, to restore some of these units. And uh, we will get into the August 22nd through 28th period of the invasion of Serbia. End of turn five and the, it's kind of a fluid situation. Um, so first of all, the Austro-Hungarians had to pull back a division to reincorporate back here. Uh, and in that absence, uh, we had to reshuffle some of this river line defense. Um, this unit needs to stay there because there's a big stack uh, here and there's a big stack here and they might actually make a prepared attack next turn across the river. The Serbians trying to get to these three hexes if they can. This stack made a daring crossing of the river after um, successfully repelling uh, this stack on the last uh, before the last interface. Um, made a cross across the river and there's just a couple of regiments here in this town. And so um, they decided that even with the half... Um, penalty to their stats. There wasn't really anyone within range that could counterattack them without leaving somewhere else vulnerable. So uh, they actually did uh, decide to make an attack here. Unfortunately, it was inconclusive. Uh, but these two regiments are, are holding on, essentially, um, until some backup can arrive. And this guy next turn, at the end of next turn, is going to get back to full strength and he'll be across the river and the pontoon bridge will be built. And suddenly that opens up a lot of options for the Serbians. Now, they do have to be worried here because this noose is starting to tighten a little bit. The Austro-Hungarians made some attacks. They didn't go quite so great, but the shift of the um, Eighth Corps around the north end of the line has now sort of uh, put some pressure um, on this part of the map. And... Uh, um, you know, there have been some attacks and counterattacks. You can see that the lines are kind of like twisting into each other. Um, a lot of these units are, especially on the Austro-Hungarian side, are actually close to becoming combat ineffective. Uh, this unit here is trying to recover quickly so it can get back to the front and help support. 
Uh, this unit tried to attack this 0-2 unit down here and ended up, uh, like, failing miserably. He took a hit on a counterattack uh, from this division. So this is all very uncertain. Uh, I would say the Serbians right now kind of have the upper hand, but the Austro-Hungarians are pushing forward. Now, the one thing they do have to be careful about is if they, they don't push so hard that suddenly they're retreating and losing all this ground that they're taking. So that would be a concern for them. Um, but in general, I think the Serbians are doing pretty well up here in the north. They're actually sort of changing the pacing of, of the, the tempo of the campaign, and they're actually going to go on to the attack uh, up here above the, the Sava River on this next turn. Down here in the mountains, well, you can see that the 16th Corps of the Austro-Hungarian Army uh, ended up pushing back this uh, Montenegrin uh, uh, brigade um, who that combat was actually really bad and there was just like a very small chance that he would not uh, fail his combat uh, post-combat post effectiveness check and he actually rolled a three so he didn't suffer any degradation but he has been pushed back now to uh, Plevlier and that's problematic because he's the only thing standing between uh, there's uh, basically two divisional equivalents in this stack from the 16th Corps they've got supply a supply line now um, and with this depot moved up, they can kind of push this offensive. Now that's bad because if this core reaches, uh, this, this strategic objective for this army, then suddenly everyone's freed up to go do whatever they want to do. Um, and while these defenders are doing uh, quite a good job, uh, this unit has a decision to make. And that is, do they fall back to help the Montenegrins and block off this approach, um, to this, uh, to this city, this town? And that's going to, that, if they do that, that's going to allow the Austro-Hungarians to kind of move south, um, which could spell all sorts of trouble for um, the Utsitsche uh, Corps for the uh, Serbian army. So this, is, this one's a puzzle down here, and um, figuring out the defensive line is, is going to be real critical for the Serbians to prevent this sort of from collapsing. Now, I did, I did hold this uh, regiment in reserve for the most part for the whole game to see if maybe they needed some help down here. He's not going to be able to get down here in very quickly, um, but there is some backup. And, you know, maybe depending on how some of these attacks go next turn, maybe the Serbians can pull some of these units off the line and uh, just get them down here um, to at least try and hold on. Uh, it's going to be tight. This is a pretty powerful stack. They haven't really suffered much degradation. They haven't really had much challenge. So um, should be uh, should be a good thrust as they go for this strategic objective hex. Turn six. Here we go. Uh, we have reached the second interphase, which is basically the end of August here in Serbian Miss Serbian. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of a tale of mixed successes across the board. Uh, down here in the very south, the Montenegrins have been pushed back and the 16th Corps has uh, actually taken these strategic objectives. So the Austrian 6th Army uh, is now free to pursue their own goals and aims. They don't have to, they're not forced to follow to get to these areas. So um, Priepolier was taken and Plev Plevlier was taken by the Austro-Hungarians. Um, these, uh, importantly down here, you've got some, uh, Montenegrin ent entrance hexes, which is why I think the Austro-Hungarians are going to leave these brigades behind to sort of, um, prevent the Montenegrins from coming on the map and, um, uh, potentially attacking again. This 18th uh, infantry division is going to go after these Montenegrins. There's victory points uh, on the hoof there. And once this road is open, you can see that suddenly the 16th Corps uh, will be able to threaten, potentially, if they can stay in supply, uh, up to the Uziche uh, sort of base of operations. Speaking of the Uziche base of operations, um, ultimately, the breakthrough down here um, that essentially the there was a... Serbian brigade here that got surrounded. It stayed too long, couldn't hold out. Um, that really messed it up. It has had to retreat way back towards the supply lines. And that just made this whole situation untenable. With this road open, the uh, Austro-Hungarians could basically surround a lot of these units. So the Serbians are in the midst of falling back. They're trying to protect um, Usice itself here, um, which is a strategic objective, but the Austro-Hungarians at this point don't need it anymore. They are probably more concerned with getting control of this road that leads north because uh, that's where, I'll move this back so you can see, that's where um, a majority of the fighting has been taking place and that's where a majority of the reinforcements are needed. So uh, as they make their way along here, the Serbians have left a screening force to try and slow these guys down, but essentially um, they're going to make it as hard as possible for the Serbians to start cutting up these roads and taking Usice. 
Okay, where do we begin up in this uh, mess of what's been happening? So, um, the as you can see, the Austro-Hungarian fleet um, has come by, destroyed the pontoon bridge here. This unit was able to get back across the river before that happened, and they were going to be cut out of supply. So, unfortunately, the sort of event offensive into Budiana Vici on, in the west up here uh, stalled out, and this unit had to come back and reinforce, primarily because the Austro-Hungarians were able to sneak an infantry division in here. Um, and start and threaten to score points in Sabak. Uh, so uh, they've had to, the Serbians have had to kind of like readjust and re, um, refocus their efforts. Uh, they did eventually drive him out of Sabak. Unfortunately, the Austro Hungarians were only able to get one point out of it, and now this unit is actually demoralized, so it's going to have to retreat to uh, recover and reform. Uh, there's a lot of weak units in here. This Drina 1 unit on top of this mountain is, is really the linchpin to the whole thing and has been keeping this defense sort of intact. Uh, Drina 2 also in good shape. This 13th Brigade is uh, about to break, essentially become combat ineffective, and so is this Cavalry Division. Serbians are probably going to pull him back this turn and move up fresh units from the east. Um, ultimately, you can see way off to the west here, there's a couple infantry divisions that uh, have just been smashed. Um, the Austro-Hungarians did not roll well in their attacks. The Serbian counterattacks were really effective, and so they've had to spend the last couple turns um, recomposing themselves. This one's almost done. He should be able to move next turn. And the 42nd Infantry Division is going to now um, move up and try and push forward with some of these units in here. But the problem is, is that uh, they've got another fresh infantry division in the south to contend with, and it's just really hard to get any sort of momentum going in here. It's going to take some organization and patience, I think. In fact, the one thing I'm learning about this system is that if you don't have patience, you're basically dead on the vine. Um, the combat system is very grindy and slow, and the movement rates in this game pretty slow as well. So you've really got to be patient and set up your offensives, set up your lines, and then you can get your offensives in. But even then, there's no guarantee they're going to work. So that's what's sort of attributing to sort of the lack of progress up here and kind of the back and forth nature of this uh, of this kind of struggle. Um, Serbians are just fine to leave it like that because, you know, the, the Austro-Hungarians, this is the furthest advance and that's not worth any points yet. So uh, they're doing okay. Above the Sava River, the Serbians are doing more than okay. So um, you can see a couple of infantry divisions have decided to move north of the river. The uh, On the final turn before this interface, actually, the entire 4th Corps of the Serbian uh, Army Group SB was actually recalled, presumably to fight the Russians. So there is not a lot of force left here. There's an infantry division up here recovering. There's an infantry brigade in a, in a um, regiment stacked here. But uh, they're going to be in big trouble once these units cross. And then obviously there's always the threat of this crossing as well. And there's just not really enough to counterattack with here. The Austro-Hungarians are going to be on the back foot. And the Serbians obviously are going to go for these victory points, which is potentially a total of 15 or 20. I can't remember. I think it's five per location or 20 all told together. So if they can, can take those and declare their once per game uh, sort of conquest of Sirmian, um, then things are looking pretty bad. The Austro-Hungarians are, are being essentially thrust back into Austria-Hungary uh, in the north here, and then obviously that will leave these Serbian units free to swing around if they can get that far and uh, potentially flank the north north side of the um, the line over in the west. So that's where things kind of stand right now. The game has been kind of slow going just because there's a lot of stuff you have to do. But if we look at the map, this is kind of the state of things. I think the Austro-Hungarians' best opportunity is going to be down there in the south. Um, to kind of change their fortunes, and um, the Serbians basically will have free reign in the north. Um, so yeah, interesting game so far, and uh, we'll continue on. We just finished the third interphase, which means we're about to start turn 10, beginning of September 1914. And the situation has changed dramatically in favor of the Serbians, uh, starting down, well, for the most part, down here in the south, the Austro-Hungarians have actually been making pretty good progress. The um, This infantry division here has actually put the hurt on the Plievli and Montenegrin brigade uh, pretty heavily. They drove them out of this hex that was 5 VP, pushed them back along the road, and now there's serious threats here to the Serbian supply line north. Um, and while they do have a pretty strong infantry division and some brigades and assets in here, uh, they are now fighting a two-front uh, conflict in this terrible terrain for all involved. And uh, actually, this uh, this limb unit has spent the last oops has spent the last uh, several turns trying to recover. Um, as you can see, uh, some combat ineffective right now, but it was actually in a demoralized state. The Montenegrins also combat ineffective, so there's going to have to be a lot of falling back in order to get some of this status repaired, and uh, that's going to leave this road wide open for the Austro-Hungarian player. 
to sweep in there. So the, the noose is tightening and ultimately the uh, Austro-Hungarians want to be able to drive north in behind the line where the 2nd and 3rd Corps and are fighting off the Austro-Hungarian 8th and 13th Corps and the 5th Army. Um, that's pretty much been a stalemate across the board. Uh, a lot of units have been uh, getting uh, worn down with the fighting. There's just a lot of bad terrain and just not a, a, a real way, especially with the Austro-Hungarian restrictions on where they can move. They've got to basically push through on the axis of advance that they have started and they can't do anything else, uh, which is problematic and has put a lot of their units. I mean, these units you've seen now for several turns have been back here uh, just recovering to try and get back into the fight. Now they're almost done, so that should provide some oomph to hopefully get the Austro-Hungarians back into it. There's a, there's a soft spot in this line here where this uh, terrain is is not too bad. So uh, this this unit has gone into two hex mode to try and uh, to hold that defensively until that can happen and that counter push can uh, go on. Uh, but in general, the the third core of the Serbians, um, you know, they've not taken many hits. And meanwhile, the fifth army, uh, you can see that the combat and effectiveness levels are are getting up there. So really, any conflict in here is bound to send a unit over the edge and force them to pull back. And so the Austro-Hungarians have not been making a lot of attacks. Um, and, you know, except if they think that they can get an advantage. Now, the problem in general, and I think, I don't want to say this is a problem with the game, but it's certainly affecting my enjoyment of the game. And that is, um, you can see here some of these, these infantry divisions. The Austro-Hungarians, to a unit, have three proficiency. And the Serbians have four proficiency. And that is across the entire game. I don't know that there is any single infantry division on either side that has different proficiency ratings. While that may make for a good historical representation of the army's sort of fighting capabilities and, you know, based on research and, and what have you that the designer has done about this game, it certainly does not make for a very fun experience for the Austro-Hungarian player because that difference between the two, even, even on the smaller, less potent uh, divisions here, uh, means that the Austro-Hungarians are fighting a column shift left every single time they attack. So any benefit they're getting from prepared attack markers, which is the only real way that they can, you know, attack without getting odds put against them on the combat table, is nullified by that. And it just doesn't make sense to me that every single unit in the entire, in three separate armies on the Austro-Hungarian side and one entire national army on the Serbian side would have the exact same proficiency rating for every unit. You know, maybe that's an abstraction of the scale in that an infantry division you know, if they were Serbian, had basically this effectiveness and Austro-Hungarian had this effectiveness. But from a gameplay standpoint, it does not make things very dynamic. And in fact, as I'm getting into turn 10 here, this game, playing this game feels a lot like <laughs> fighting World War One. Um, it's a lot of pushing for not a lot of results. It's a lot of um, stalemate situations. And in general, the dynamic the dynamism of the gameplay is not very high because you're constantly with the Austro-Hungarians struggling to get forces against these big uh, Serbian uh, divisions, and there's just not enough difference between the units to really make have an effect, especially when you also take into account not just the proficiency ratings, but the actual attack and defense strength, which again, may be historically accurate in terms of like the capabilities and force that these infantry divisions could do, but from a gameplay standpoint, you're one-to-one -one at any division-on-division -division combat. You bring in a brigade like this and with a five, which is about half, less than half of what these divisions have, that's not enough to shift a column necessarily. And so I'm, I'm finding that I'm constantly locked into these, these situations where, um, you know, a big division like this versus a brigade, yeah, probably good, but in, in rough terrain basically evens them out. And there's almost no reason to attack when you're evened out because um, at that point, um, the combat results table is so swingy that you may end up doing more damage to yourself than you do to the defender. Now, again, very evocative of World War One, but in terms of just wanting to do stuff on your turn, there's just a lot of turns that have gone by where both sides have just chosen not to do anything, really, um, because either the Austro-Hungarians can't overcome this proficiency advantage if they have enough force, or the Serbians... Um, you know, there's no reason for them to attack. They're just trying to keep the Austro-Hungarians out. So you've really got a stalemate in here that I don't know. It's very difficult to figure out how to play this game well. And I am trying, let me tell you. Um, but I, I have to be honest, I'm a little disappointed with just the feel of the overall flow of the combat. Um, so I'll have more thoughts uh, at the end of this at the end of this playthrough as well. But I just wanted to kind of point that out, that, you know, the reason there's no movement in here is because there's no actual good reason to do it based on the way the game is built. Now, conversely, because of those same factors, because of the fact that these proficiency ratings are so high, 
the Serbians, um, and especially now that the river level here, the water is low and has forced the um, Austro-Hungarian river fleets to have to basically retreat to base, um, that has opened up this crossing in a huge way. And the uh, army group Sermian Banat, uh, which was not very powerful to begin with, has now in, is now in a situation where um, they have been pushed back basically all the way to the Donau. And the Serbians have sent three infantry divisions across the river and are essentially going to do whatever they want up here and essentially stop the northern offense, offensive from the Austro-Hungarians cold. Um, so, again, not very fun to play the Austro-Hungarians uh, as one of their sort of lines of advance is basically crumbled. The combination of the river being low and also losing the core that was uh, started the game in this arm, in this what was the second army up here. Uh, so now the Serbians can basically do whatever they want. And as you can see, their forces are basically exceed that of the Austro-Hungarians. Um, basically, in any... In any other than other than this mountain advance, which has been fun to play, um, this whole part of the game has been, um, as the Austro-Hungarians, pretty dismal uh, from all areas. And for the Serbians, um, it just feels like they're extremely overpowered. Like the balance in here is skewed way towards the Serbian player. Now, I get that that may be intentional, and I get that obviously we're going to have reinforcements and a new core at some point is going to come on up here. And um, you know there might be the opportunity to push back, especially once you know these divisions get into the into the game. But um, I have been less than enthused about sort of the the way that the game unfolds here. It's very predictable. It's very static, and um, ultimately there's no reason for a lot of the time for the Austro-Hungarians to actually attack because they're going in knowing that they're outgunned by the the proficiency rating of the Serbians and the strength of their division. So. You know, that said, I have, like, there's something compelling about this system that does keep me playing, so I'm not, I don't want to abandon it just yet. It's just, it, it just feels very weird, I guess. Um, and, you know, it could be the scale of the game. Um, but, you know, I'm willing to keep going to see where I net out. I'll probably do a couple more inter, uh, interfaces and see, you know, how the game changes, if at all. I think the most fun is going to be, you know, if there's a breakthrough here, and that will shift the entire uh, Serbian outlook towards what's happening. So we'll see if we can make that happen. But again, swingy combat table means that it's possible I just end up, the Austro-Hungarians end up throwing their, banging their heads against the wall down here. So anyways, that's where we stand. Going into turn 10, September 5th. And uh, I'll probably check in again after the next interphase, which is three turns from now. Uh, one other thing that bears mentioning here real quick is that, as you can see, the yellow cubes have disappeared from these locations up here. That means that the Serbians scored 15 points for control, uh, basically, of Sermian. In addition to that, um, they uh, absolutely surrounded these, these divisions up here, surrounded and actually eliminated the brigade that was protecting Semlin, along with the artillery that was there. So in addition to the 15 points... The Serbians are now getting uh, one point every turn for the rest of the game um, because that artillery unit in Semlin is no longer bombarding Beograd. So um, from a victory point standpoint, uh, how many turns do we have left? We've got 30 turns left, so that's potentially 30 points for the Serbians. Um, and combined with Sabak, which the Austro-Hungarians have not been able to take, that's two more points every turn, potentially up to 60 points. I just don't see how the Austro-Hungarians are supposed to come back and win this, um, even if they are able to take some of the, the victory point hexes, um, like Beograd, for example. Um, it just seems insurmountable. So uh, the game may be called way before we get to turn 40, which is unfortunate that it, the victory conditions seem extremely imbalanced. Uh, small correction here. Um, so I missed it the first time, and I would not be... Uh, Surprised if most people missed it because it's microscopic, but this tiny white dot in the middle of the Donau River here represents ferries. That is a movement path that the Austro-Hungarians are allowed to take when they move. It just adds to the movement cost, and it's a way across the Donau River, which you're not allowed to do otherwise. You can see there's another one up here. They're extremely small. So um, I, I missed that when this uh, brigade and artillery unit were surrounded down here at Semlin by the Serbians. And they were forced to take a retreat, and they couldn't, and that usually uh, causes an elimination. Well, kind of another black hole in the rules, but um, there's nothing in the rules that says you cannot uh, retreat across a ferry, uh, across the Donau, that I could find. And for the most part, ferries are treated as just sort of a movement modifier, because it's a hex side. So uh, I'm going to say that this Lutkendorf Brigade, who I had eliminated previously, could actually have um, retreated across these ferries... Uh, to this, which this is a reinforcement that's shown up, uh, but he would have gone here. 
Um, the, the, it doesn't really change much because this artillery unit uh, is actually restricted to where it can be in Sirmia. So it's got to stay on this side of the Donau. So that probably would have been eliminated, which doesn't necessarily change the point scoring, but it does uh, preserve a uh, force of Austro-Hungarians up here that they uh, haven't had for the last couple of turns. So I'm going to say they were retreated across the ferries. If you've played the system and you have some insight into whether that's legal or not, let me know. But for now, that's the way it's going to be. And maybe they can mount a counterattack at some point uh, to get back in there. All right, a couple of real important attacks here for the Austro-Hungarians. I thought I would do it on camera. Um, the... As you can see, the Azice Corps is kind of in disarray. These two units chose to back off because they're still trying to reform into order. The Montenegrins are stuck here doing the same. And this infantry division has pinned down what is essentially a regiment with a plus one strength marker under it, uh, which could go very badly. And while pinned, uh, these two units also pinned this division from preventing him from uh, reinforcing. So um, the attacks aren't great, but we might get a breakthrough here. We might be able to have a chance to surround this Sumadia 2nd uh, Infantry Division, which would be pretty disastrous for the Serbians. So let's see what happens here. So uh, this division here is 9 going against 4, plus an additional 4 for the low, uh, low mountains. No, those are... Uh, sorry, that is um, foothills actually. Um, so that is only a plus two, but halved artillery value. So we've got six, we've got nine to six, so that's 1.5 to one. Now the proficiency rating is better for the Serbians, so that cancels the column shift for the prepared attack. So we've got a 1.5 to one attack uh, in this hex against this regiment. That is going to be a small attack, um, but the attackers are going to choose attacker uh, intense. Uh, the defenders Mm, they're only a regiment, so they probably don't want to. Um, hmm, they probably don't want to do defender intense. Uh, well, actually, the odds, the column, it's not so bad on the this CRT. Only four of the possible twelve results would actually result in an addition to their their value. So they are going to do defender intense. So that means it's a high. That would make it a high intensity combat, which actually, yeah, it's going to be a high. Mm, no, they're going to just let it be attacker. Um, the regiment is not going to uh, choose intensity, so it's just going to be attacker and inten an attacker intense combat. Uh, we roll, we get a 7, that's perfectly average, and uh, that is going to be a plus 3, plus 3 after the modifier. However, it is going to cause a retreat. Uh, for this unit who is going to retreat to there. Um, that's not good. <laughs> that is not good. Of all the possible things that could have been rolled, that retreat was very low odds. So it's plus three, plus three on a small combat, no loss, no strength reductions. Now we have to do the post-combat effectiveness check. Uh, we'll start with the 18th uh, Austro-Hungarian Division. That is going to pass easily. Now the Makragora Regiment, they are plus three on this roll. They rolled an 11. Thankfully, they just make their check. Uh, so no losses, but certainly the regiment got pushed back, and that makes this infantry division get to go there, which is very bad now for this uh, for this attack here because that actually uh, is going to be a two-column shift. Uh, no, that's not true. They would be isolated if this unit hadn't retreated there, but um, or flanked, excuse me. The term is flanking. There's a two-column shift for flanking in this game. But because there's a unit here, this unit is actually able to trace through that hex. Um, so that cancels the flank, which is lucky. Uh, this is going to be a prepared attack. So we have got 6 plus 11, that's 17, to 13, plus the 2 from those foothills, that's 15. So 17 to 15 is 1 to 1. The prepared attack column shift is canceled by the difference between the proficiency, and incidentally, uh, my lead unit will probably be uh, this first brigade here. Um, okay, so we're 1 to 1, column shift canceled there. Artillery is halved, so they have 1, and we have Ooh, actually, we have five. Habd is three, so it actually will give us artillery superiority for the Austro-Hungarians. So uh, that is going to be a column shift to the right for artillery, and I believe that is it. So we're actually on the three to two column. 
So let's roll that up. Attacker intense, definitely. Uh, the Serbians probably want to get out of this uh, as quickly as possible, so they're not going to be intense. Fighting retreat. That is the most terrible roll you can roll. That is a 12. That is uh, actually extremely bad for the Austro-Hungarians. Again, here's the swinging combat system in effect. Uh, this could have been anything from a plus 1, plus 6 to a plus 4, minus 1, which is, an, is a plus 4, minus 1, and is actually because it was attacker intense. Attacker intense is actually a plus 5, minus 1. Um, so that was a 1, 2, 3, and a quarter. So that was a medium-sized combat. Medium-sized combat, that is one hit to the defender. Sorry, the attacker and no hits to the defender, so that is actually a strength reduction here. Um, and then we need to roll. So plus five, uh, that's a 15 for this post-combat effectiveness check here. He fails that by a whopping seven, uh, which is going to be minus three efficiency steps, plus a retreat, plus another retreat because he's demoralized. So that is... Uh, he's going to be D1. And again, you're seeing here the uh, just the utter sort of propensity for the game to absolutely, uh, what looked like a strategically smart decision, absolutely punish you uh, randomly. One, two... And he is done. So now we got to check for each of these guys. It's one roll, but we check against each of them. This is a plus five. Probably not going to go well. Oh, they rolled snake eyes. Uh, so it's seven for each of them. So it's the first brigade and the eighth brigade. They are both passing that just fine. And so ultimately what we have here is an infantry division that got repulsed heavily despite not being the lead unit. Um, and two brigades that came out unscathed, and obviously this Serbian we got to check for, uh, actually they passed, minus, well, uh, we haven't checked for them yet, they're minus one, uh, yeah, they pass easily, okay, uh, so that's that combat, uh, pretty, the result is, uh, pretty inconclusive, I would say the Serbians now have the better position, although they still have to be careful about being surrounded here, because if these, this brigade comes in here, then suddenly this guy's gonna be potentially, um, flanked on the next turn. So 